Good morning, everyone. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. It is still Christmas. You know that, right? This is the eighth day of Christmas. So, you should have what? Are there maids of milking? Lords of leaping? Which one? Do you know? What's that? Maids. It's maids of milking. Yes. Eight maids of milking. So, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Today is January 1st. If your clocks are off or you didn't know, my goodness, where you been? <clears throat> Speaking of where you've been, 2022. What's your top 10 events of 2022 for the, for the, for the nation or for the world better? Now, <clears throat> I've put together a list. <laughs> you may or may not like it. It may or may not fit you, but let's see how we do. The top most searched thing outside of the common things that are searched every day was Wordle. How many of you know Wordle? It's the annoying game that everybody posts and uh, yeah, okay, great. So that was number 10. Number nine, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard were way up there on the list of important things. Is that important? Is anybody? Boo, right, I hear you. Eight, <clears throat> Elon Musk bought Twitter. <laughs> Seven, inflation. Boo, I hear you. Amen. Six, now watch what you say and do here. <laughs> she, Jinping, just took the third term as general secretary and president of China. He will have a lifetime appointment more than likely, right? I mean, he is the new guy in charge. It used to be a one-party thing. Now it's a one-man thing. Be careful. Uh, five, <clears throat> Iran uprising against, there was an Iranian uprising against the hijab, and the, the, the uh, what do they call them? The morality police have stepped down and are no more. Isn't that, that's a good thing, right? We're happy about that. <clears throat> and number six, hold on, you know, five, that was five, we're on four, I'm going backwards, brain. <laughs> four is a two-parter. Eight billion people now live in the world isn't that crazy? We crossed over from seven something to eight billion this year. And as a second parter to that, um, India is going to overtake China as the most populated country in the world, likely this year. And they are, their economy is due to surpass China's as well. Isn't that amazing? So uh, let's see. That was uh, and number three, COVID eases. It's like, it's, it's still out there, but it's not as bad, right? Yay. Uh, number two, some of you are like, this shouldn't be on the list maybe, but it's a big deal. Queen Elizabeth passed away, right? She was the longest reigning monarch of England, period. And number one, really not a good one, Russia invaded Ukraine. And I have friends, I have many friends who uh, are involved with Ukraine. One of them helped to establish a, a, basically a Christian college there. And the Russians came, took it over, destroyed it, threw all the books from the whole library into the dump, and they're destroyed. And like, that breaks my heart. But worse than that, uh, this friend of mine has many friends there who are still suffering because of, of the invasion and the constant bombardment military-wise. So top 10, well, biggest things, right? The reason I pull that out is today we're talking about God's character. And it is one of the biggest issues of the whole Bible. And in fact, it's one of the biggest issues of, of our current culture. That when you talk about God in the Bible, <sighs> boo! Like many people will be, why would you bring that up? We don't talk about that. But we're going to talk about it from a whole different perspective that I think shows a much greater informed and aware, loving perspective on the Old Testament and on God, and then hopefully on us. So, this morning is the, the kickoff of a new sermon series, God's Character, and today we're talking about our choices in this. So as we get started, let's pray. God, we ask you to open our hearts. Let us hear from you. Let us know what it is to be important in your eyes, but also to have you as important in ours. God, guide us as we read your word and think about you and feast on Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So, a reminder, we just finished the sermon series about the great big story, Creation, Fall, Israel, Redemption, Consummation. And we're going to keep this in front of you for a little while um, because today we're talking about Israel. And as you know, maybe you don't, <laughs> the Old Testament, according to the Jews, has 24 scrolls. 
24 scrolls. You see all the minor prophets are joined into one and they're called the 12. And that's the scroll of the 12. And many of ours that are first and second are really just one considered one book. Um, they might be on two scrolls, but they'd be considered one book, like First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and, and some of the others are also joined. But anyways, so there's only 24 scrolls there. And in it, the first one is Genesis. The second one is Exodus. Well done. And in Exodus, the first part of that is... Um, the, the, oh, actually, the passage we're looking at today that you, we just had read was, is highlighted more than 20 times in the Old Testament. It, it's um, 12 times, I believe, it's directly quoted, and 12 times it's alluded to. It also shows up in uh, Mary's uh, Magnificat, the, the prayer slash praise of song that she gives at the beginning. Uh, we have some folks trying to get in at the back. If somebody wants to help them, that would be wonderful. Um, so... Uh, Next, in Exodus, though, the book can be divided in first through the 18th chapters. They're leaving Egypt. They're getting out of Egypt, right? And in the second half, 19 through 40, they're at Sinai. And they're camping there for about a year. And there's a whole lot going on there, right? Um, an interesting thing happens at Sinai. Uh, there's this ceremony in chapters 19 through 24 where basically it's God saying, I would like to marry you. Would you marry me? And he's brought them out of Egypt, led them away from captivity and said, you will be my people and I will be your God. And they're like, yay, maybe. What are the terms? <laughs> and he gives them the terms, but they already knew the terms. Follow God, be with him, do, do what he says, right? But then the Ten Commandments which we often call the Ten Commandments, but they're actually called the Ten Words because they're not exactly uh, commands in that language. They're, they're the words of God, and there's ten of them, and we give them the title commandments. But anyways, um, it kind of matches, though, that in Genesis, in the week of creation, there are ten times that God speaks. And that's just an interesting little fact that, that's that, that should prompt something in our brains in some way and help us to kind of think through things differently because this is a new creation that's happening with the nation of Israel. He's calling them into a new way of being human. And um, in this, in chapters 25 through 31, are the blueprints for how to build the tabernacle, how to assemble the tabernacle. And then in verses, or chapters 35 through 40, there's the building of the tabernacle. And you, you might have noticed we forgot a few chapters. And that's where God's character is revealed. Because remember, in Exodus, this second scroll, there's a lot of stuff happening. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff. But we're going to zero in on that one verse that we just read a little bit ago and, and talk about it. Because here it is, God's character. They've been given the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, and... and They've already broken them with the golden calf, right? And Aaron, the older brother of Moses, the older brother, has said, oh, well, they just gave me all this gold. We threw it in the fire and out jumped this calf. <laughs> and then we're going to worship it. And the first commands are, like, worship no other god and, and don't make an idol. And they already did it. And so God says, I'm going to destroy them, Moses, and I'm going to start over with you. And Moses says, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. The Egyptians... <laughs> They're going to see what you're doing and they're, they're going to go, you're not a God that's worthy to be trusted. And all the nations around are going to laugh at you and say you're not a good God because you couldn't control your people. And so God, you know, listens to Moses and kind of repents and, and says, that's okay. We'll, we'll fix it. And in the midst of this, God, uh, I should say in the midst of this, Moses wants to know God better. Moses intercedes for the people and acts in many ways like God by interceding and saying, I love these people. I'm caring for them. I long for them. And, and at the same, Moses wants to know God better and says, I want to see you. I want to know you. Tell me who you are. Tell me more about you, right? And so this is God saying to Moses, this is me. This is who I am. And this is a huge deal. So here's God's character. Yahweh, Yahweh. Now, in your Bibles, typically it says what? The Lord. And Lord is in all caps, right? And that Lord is the tetragrammatron is what it's technically called. It's the four letters of God's name interspersed with Adonai. And, and it's so that you don't misspell or mispronounce or mess it up. It's Y-H-W-H -H in our 
historical way of hearing it, but, but it's Yahweh or Jehovah is another way to say it. They're the same thing. One's just the Greek, one's the Hebrew variety of it. And that's a lot of technical blah, right? But at the same time, Yahweh is the Lord's name. That's really important, isn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody does their best to say my name, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be thankful for that. If they won't ever say my name, I'm going to be a little upset. Hey, you, guy over there, I'm talking to you. That's really annoying. If they can at least try to pronounce my name, then I'll learn how they're trying to pronounce it, and I would accept that. I would, I would work with them on it, right? And you're the same. So this is God's name, Yahweh. Yahweh. And it's doubled up here because it's like super important. You should pay attention. Anytime you see something twice in Hebrew, it's really important. And then a God, compassionate and gracious. This is the beginning of God's character. Just after the golden calf episode, really important, right? Compassionate, gracious. And then overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. I, I can't help but just just exude this joy and this love and this, this faithfulness. And, and both of these lines have three words each in the Hebrew. So they, they're, they're a poetic thing and they rhyme a little bit, right? And in the middle is this slow to anger. And we really want that. We are desperate for that, right? I don't know about you, but I am very thankful for God's patience because if it was one strike and you're out, I would have been out long ago. I've probably got more than a few thousand strikes against me. How about you? <laughs> so, uh, but here's the big ones. Here's the five characters, character traits of God that we're going to study over the next five weeks or so. And so God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, loyal love, faithfulness. That's beautiful, isn't it? That's what we want to know about God. Now the next part we really don't like, and we really don't want to know it. <laughs> But we're going to do it anyways. <laughs> um, I'm trying to. He maintains loyal love for thousands. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? He maintains loyal love for thousands. Well, what about millions, God? What about billions? We now have 8 billion people on the planet, right? So it's kind of a big deal. We, we need to know what this thousands is about. Um, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. We, we like that. Forgiveness is, is related to graciousness. We, we're happy with that. We like that, right? Yet he won't declare innocent the guilty. What is that? Yet he won't declare innocent the guilty. So if you're guilty, God's not going to go, oh, let's just whitewash that. We'll just paint over that and act like it doesn't exist. <laughs> no, he's going he's to say, if you're guilty, you're guilty. There's some judgment there, isn't there? There's some... Ugh, ugh, I don't want to hear that. I, I, I prefer all the lovey-dovey stuff. Come on, don't, don't do this part, right? Uh, he will bring the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and the grand... Now that's worse. <laughs> the, the last line wasn't so good. This line gets worse, and it's, it's a little problematic. And, and this is where the culture today says, you can't do that. Knock it off. Do not judge me based on the parents. Do not judge me based on the grandparents. And, and my culture is my culture, and me is me, and I am me, and nobody's like me, and leave me alone, right? Just look at me, and that's it. But actually, the way that this is worded is, is much more in the frame of that. The difficulty is this, that when you are a child of your parents and a grandchild of your grandparents, you've picked up some of their culture, their habits, their behaviors, right? Right? If your parents went to church, how likely are you to go to church? Historically, much more likely. If your parents said, we're atheists, we don't go to church, how likely would it be for you to go to church? A little less likely, right? And so that's really what this verse is saying. When you choose God, your children will have an easier time choosing God. But don't worry, everybody's going to be judged on their own. And yet, here's the other issue. To the third and the fourth. What is this third and the fourth? This is the Hebrew wording of it. To the third and the fourth what? Generation. Now that's what your versions imply. They know that it's implied, so they stick it in there. The difficulty is they miss something. To the third and the fourth, before we move on though, think about this. How many of you have had a time in your life when three and four generations live under one roof? 
Your grandparents lived with you. Your great-grandparents were in the home as well. Many of you that are older had that. In, in my <laughs> growing up, we kind of did. At some point, my, my dad bought an apartment building, remodeled a space for my grandma, and she stayed in that apartment until we sold the building, much later. But we didn't live in the same house, the same home. We lived in the same structure, but she had her space and we had ours, and they didn't mix very often, Christmas occasionally. <laughs> so that was a different kind of a thing. But in that time period, and in yours, you can't help but intermingle, right? When the grandparents and the great-grandparents all live together, you hear the babies crying, you hear the parents coughing, you, you hear all the noises of everybody and all the things. And when you sit down to the dinner table, everybody's sitting together, right? That's a very different world. Now, let's, let's outline this a little bit. Thousands of generations. He maintains loyal love to thousands of generations. Just like this one household will be judged. You see, the third and the fourth is saying that whole home will be judged for the wrong that they do. And that shows up in Scripture, doesn't it? Where, where somebody's family does something really bad, like they take gold they're not supposed to, and then the earth swallows up that whole family, the whole tribe, the whole group around, well, not the tribe, just that whole clan, that whole group. The father, the mother, the children, the cousins, whoever was in their tent, so to speak, went into the earth with them. That was Achan, right? Achan's sin. But look at that. Here's the issue. Judgment on one family, but loyal love to thousands of generations. I think that covers millions and billions, wouldn't you? That's amazing. Now, the next part shows up interesting. Forgiving iniquity, but he will bring the iniquities of the fathers upon the children. He's saying, I don't want you to do this generational sin thing. I would much prefer you live in my grace. But if you won't accept my grace and you turn your back on me and you walk away, how, how can I show you love? I'm doing everything I can. And in the center of it, he won't declare innocent the guilty. There is a certain sense of, of judgment. We've got to deal with sin. We can't let it go. That's what God's saying among God's self, you know, Father, Son, Spirit. We, we don't let this stuff go. And then we bring back in those five qualities. Slow to anger. He won't declare innocent the guilty. Maintaining loyal love for thousands, but yet needing to judge, right? And so that's what we're going to investigate, is how does God deal with needing to like, deal with sin, yet being incredibly patient, incredibly slow to anger, willing to just work with people? And he's showing that, because he says, okay, Moses, I won't wipe out the whole nation. For the sake of who? For the sake of Abraham, for the sake of my promise to him and you reminding me of that promise, I will not wipe him out. And then that's how this passage is used again and again the whole way through the Old Testament. It's reminding God of his promise and saying, look, look, you made this promise. We're going to hold you to it. Now look, we all sinned. We messed up. We get it. Now, now, forgive us. <laughs> Make it right for us. Let us be good in your eyes. We know we deserve it, but you know... But for the sake of Abraham, you remember what you said to Moses, save us, be patient, love us. But what about our character today? Well, you remember who came after Moses, don't you? Joshua, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, after Moses was Joshua, and Joshua was told to do what? Be strong and courageous. He was also told to study the law. But you have to remember, before we go too much further, the law as we hear it is like, right, wrong, this is the command of God, you must do this, right? But when Paul, Moses, and all the Hebrews heard the law, what they heard was the teachings, the Torah. They heard these are the teachings of God, the Torah. So, 
That's a big cultural shift, isn't it? If you hear law and you think, oh, I'm judge guilty, and they hear teachings, I'm being trained how to live rightly, like those are majorly different things, aren't they? So what if in your head you could shift away from the law to the teachings? Because that's what the Torah means. It's the words of God for your blessing and your benefit to heal you, to help you, to show you his love, to say he cares for you and he wants you to do well. Instead of, here's this big bully, this big nasty God who commands and I must obey and if I don't, he just zaps me. <laughs> that's a whole different world, isn't it? And that's where God cries out to us, I love you. Will you be like Joshua? Will, will, you, will you feast on the, the teachings of God? Will you know him? So Psalm 1, 1 through 6, the whole chapter is talking about this idea. And we're going to outline it here, kind of like we did the last one. So, blesses the one who does not walk in the step and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Now, did you notice something there? Does not walk, stand, sit. That's a progression towards sin, right? God saying, and this poet, the one writing this prayer, the Psalms were originally written not as songs, but as prayers to be prayed, and then they were turned into sung prayers. The one who does not walk, who does not sit or stand, and does not sit in sin and among sinners, therefore living their life in a way that is just wrapped up with evil. That's what that, that's saying. That, that's, the person is going to be blessed who turns their back on all of that and says, where's God? How do I find him? Right? And that's the second verse. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord or the, in the teachings of God, the Torah, who meditates on his teachings day and night. Delight, meditates, delight, kind of like you feast, you eat, you enjoy, you take it in, you, you live by it, your dopamine rushes in your brain all come from God. Like, that's a different thought, isn't it? Most of the younger people, including me, dopamine rushes come from this. Hold on, I gotta check my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram, my TikTok, my... How many other things are out there? Snapchat, uh, email, uh, text messages, and, and every time I touch this, there's a dopamine hit, and my brain goes, Whew, ha, that's good, do that again, do that again. But what this is saying is we need to replace all of the other dopamine hits in our, in our, in our life, in our world, the things that excite us and entice us. We should be saying, God, where, where, is, where, where are you in this? How do I enjoy? How do I delight? How do I get a rush from being with you? And then I meditate. I don't know about you, but there are things you meditate on, right? When you go home, what's the first thing you do? Some of you that are older, the first thing you might do is if you live alone, you might turn on the TV or the radio, right? Because you need some noise in the house. You don't like it quiet. You want some company. Well, if you're, if you're one of those people who turns on a certain news channel, whichever certain news channel that is on either side, <laughs> you're meditating on that. That's feeding you, and you are enjoying it. And you say, no, 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 I, I, I'm disgusted by it. Really? <laughs> you disgustingly enjoy it because you keep watching it. <laughs> You're disgusted by all the evil that's out there, all those bad people on the other side. They're wrong. We're right. And you build yourself up through that, right? That's not good. And so, some people turn on the radio and they're listening to the, all the music that's out there. And there was a long time ago when I was a young child, I went through all the radio stations. I mean all of them. I went through all the things that weren't on the radio. My brothers liked some death metal. Um, and so we listened to that for a little while. I listened to rap. I listened to classics. I listened to pop. I listened to Elvis and all of the 50s and 60s, the 70s. I, I listened to, uh, let me see, uh, country music. Uh, I, I even have a, had a spell with uh, the, the best version of that, which is bluegrass. 
Bluegrass is some good music. Um, but at the same time, do you know what happened? Every time I was looking for, I was on a hunt for something to feed my soul. And here's almost invariably what happened. I found that as I listened to all of that music, I was, my soul was rotting. And even today, my kids love to listen to certain music, and I'm like, I can't stand it. I've got to turn it off. Like, you can listen to it once when I'm home, and then we're done. You're not listening to it on repeat. Because that thing filling my soul tells me that I don't have enough. I don't have what I want. I need more. I need more power, more money, more women, more men, more this, more that, more. I need more. Or, if you go back to the country stuff, all those things are gone, and I'm sad and lonely. <laughs> and if you go to the death metal, it's all, the world sucks, and it's going to hell, and I'm, I'm right there with it. I'm going to destroy as much as I can. Rah, right? I mean, like, this is just, like, I don't need that in my soul. I have enough of that going on in my head that I've got to work through, that I've got to deal with. I'm, 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 I don't want to delight in that mess. I don't want to meditate on that. So my world is, is minimal music, a lot of teaching. I listen to so many podcasts and so many books, and I just fill myself with things about Scripture. And it's part of the reason that I said I need to be a preacher, because I knew that my heart was inclined in that direction, and I knew that I didn't want to be involved in all the mess. I wanted to, I wanted to, to be able to just involve myself with God as much as I could. And so... When I was younger, 23, 24, 25, I memorized this psalm, and it's just stuck with me, and I love it. So the person, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Now as you hear that, does that bring up any imagery? Does it remind you of anything? It should bring you back to the Garden of Eden. It should, it should help you to go back to a place where there's a tree planted by streams of water. Like, that's Eden. And you have a choice to make. Are you going to eat the good tree or the bad tree? Are you going to take from the one you're not supposed to or are you going to take from the one that gives you real life? Here you are chasing after the one that gives you an awareness of things you don't need. You know what I'm talking about. The good, the bad tree, the, the good and the evil, the, the one that's just going to... But if I, if I need to know this, I need to learn this, I need to understand this, right? So I've got to study more. That, that's the tree that I should not eat from. But if I eat from the good tree, the, the one that gives life eternal, then I become that tree. That's what this is saying. And that tree is planted by water whose fruit will always be there in every season that it's supposed to. And the, the picture of that tree for me is actually one of those ones that, have you ever seen the trees that have grafted into it like 15, 20 different fruit trees? I love those. They're amazing. They bloom and they flower and they're all year round. They just keep going. It's amazing. And that's what I think of when I think of this. And whose leaf does not wither. There's a constant fruiting, a constant presence of life. And you look at the tree and you go, that's a good tree. That's a good tree. That's who you can be. That's who I can be. Whatever they do prospers. Isn't that beautiful? And that takes us from the first to the third, the, the encapsulation of this, blessed, prosper. That's what we understand, right? When you're blessed, you improve, you thrive, you enjoy, you do better. And at the center of all this is the one who delights in the teachings of God, one who meditates on his law day and night, one who knows what God desires. And I live that way because I see that it's good for me and I see that I enjoy it and I enjoy life better and I have no regrets when I live this way, so I want to do this. However, not so the wicked, <laughs> right? Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Not so. Chaff blows, will not stand, nor will the sinners stand like you have no standing. You have no ground. You cannot be among the good people because you know you're bad. And here's the thing. You don't need anybody to tell you that. 
When you're living against God, you immediately start to go, I don't want to be around those righteous people. I don't, they're self-righteous. And we, 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 we pin on them all the things that we feel inside when we are living wrong. Everybody's fake. Everybody's phony. Because we're playing that way. Because we're living that way. What we really need to do is recognize that we're living in a way that we shouldn't. And we need to turn our hearts back to God. And when we do that, all this stuff, whew, but not us. Our heart returns back to God. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So there is righteous or destruction. There is the one who is right with God, who lives in a way that honors him because he knows, she knows, she knows how to live, and she does. That's wisdom. That's actually the Proverbs that Lady Wisdom calls out. Will you follow me? Will you come with me? Will you learn from me? Faith challenges. How are we going to put this into practice? What are we going to do with this? How are we going to live with all of this? With God's character and with our, our character. We have choices to make. That's the first. There are choices for us to make. You have two trees. Not the ones on the hill here. <laughs> And not the coffee shop, and not the yoga studio or whatever that thing is. You know, there's all kinds of two trees around here, but the two trees. Are you going to choose God and eternal life? Or are you going to choose the thing that tempts you, that draws you in, and that causes you more pain and more pain? And you have those choices to make. It's continually before you. The whole Bible shows this idea that there are two choices to make. And we know there's actually a thousand more but when you boil it down and you get really simple, it's either are you going to go with God and believe and trust and, and do what he calls you to or are you going to do whatever you feel like and live in a way that, that is against God and really against your nature, your real nature, the nature that God made you to be, the one who is, like your real nature is the, is the one who hears God, says where are you, walks with him, talks with him, enjoys his presence, understands life from a healthy perspective, is, is kind, compassionate, gracious, loyal love, slow to anger. It's, it's, it's the character of God. And in, in this, in all of these choices, there are voices that you hear. And you hear voices of wicked people calling out to you, come, walk with us. Talk with us. Stand over here with us. Sit down with us. Be a part of us. And those voices that cry out are, again, choices for you to make. Will, will you hear those voices that you know are not healthy or good, or will you resist them and say, no, 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 I don't need that in my soul. I don't need that mess. Now, the other voices, there's other voices that cry out, like, like the Lady Wisdom of Proverbs, who says, hey, come, enjoy, sit down with me, walk with me, talk with me. And that's the voice of God from Genesis 1 and 2. They walked and talked with God. And he, he looked for them in the cool of the day and said, Hey, how you doing? What was your day like? Oh, you ate that fruit. Oh, uh, you weren't supposed to eat that fruit. Why'd you do that? Oh, she did it. Oh, he did it. Oh, they did it. Oh, that wasn't me. Right? When we hear these competing voices, we, we were reminded we still have these choices. We need to make healthy, wise choices. And whatever it is you listen to, whatever news channel, whatever entertainment, whatever TV show, whatever so-called news, <laughs> whatever uh, other music, what, whatever games you play, whoever you sit with in your day-to-day -day life, pay attention. Listen and ask yourself deep within, is this feeding my soul? Am I growing in godliness as a result of this? Am I, am I spreading the kingdom through this relationship? Am I fulfilling the mandate of Genesis 1 that says, go into all the world? It's also Jesus' mandate from Matthew 28. 
baptize them, t- teaching them, training them, and baptizing them, right? And then help them to obey every command. Am I living in a way that, that, that measures up to all that stuff? Am I living in a way that says, God, I don't know how to do it, but I want to do it. Let me live like that. That is the call for us this year, I believe. This year, I believe we are called to continue listening to the voices out there and to be be making healthier, wiser choices and to be setting before ourselves an example of Moses who in, 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 in a great way intercedes for the people around him and says, God, please, don't destroy them. Don't do this. This is who you said you are. So, so, so be that way. Save them. And then, here's the other. In the midst of all this, you remember Moses says, you can take me. I will, I will die on their behalf. And I think that's the call for us. To hear God's voice in that, the voice of Jesus saying, God, here am I. I'll be the sacrifice. I'll die on their behalf. Let them live. Let them know you. Be gracious to them. Let's pray as Jesus has taught us to. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Father, as we continue to pray, we we lift up to you our lives, our church, our families, our communities, the people in, in just the houses next door to us and around us, and we say, God, let us find a way to love them well, to intercede for them, to bless them, that we might also be blessed, that we might know you better, and that we might know others to to come to know you, that, that we would all be saved through the power of Jesus and that we would live in a way that is, is honoring to him, to the sacrifice Jesus made, and also honoring to you, to the sacrifice you made of sending your son. God, let us live in a way that, that honors the, the call that you've put on each of our lives to, to be a representative of you to the world. And God, let us live in a way that, that shows that love, your compassion, your loyal love, your, your slow to anger nature, the, the ways that you are God, let us be those and embody those for the people around us. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen.